All right, so good evening, everyone. Tonight, we're gonna to be talking about the theories of addiction. This is from chapter two in the Phelps book, uh, which you guys have been reading. And by the way, remember, there's a homework assignment. Some of you have already turned some in um, that will, uh, that's due at the end of this week. So um, I believe it's due on Friday or Saturday, I forget which day, but what is recorded in Canvas is the correct due date. So don't miss out on that. But tonight we're talking about theories of addiction, chapter two. And a couple of weeks ago um, during a previous lecture, I talked about the four transdisciplinary foundations, right? And so this is the idea of the basic information that from which all of the core competencies, the 123 competencies for counseling is um, built on. And so foundation one is understanding addiction. So in order for us to be effective as counselors, we really do have to understand um, addiction models, right? So under, understanding the variety of models, theories of addiction, um, and, you know, and problems related to uh, substance use. And that's the first competency. The second one is underneath this is recognizing the social, political, economic, and cultural context in which addiction and substance use um, exist, right? Um, and this also includes uh, risk factors. So a lot of times when we're looking at our clients, um, you know, we're looking at what are their risk factors. And those of you that are already in the field and using the uh, ASAM criteria, the six dimensions, you know, looking at their continued use uh, risk factors, their recovery environment risk factors. Um, during the presentation earlier, you know, when someone asked about, um, do they have to come into uh, the New Leaf Center straight from detox? And, and the answer was beautiful that Michaela gave was, well, you know, it depends on how they assess, right? Um, so if they, they assess that they need the detox, then that would be the referral, right? So looking at those uh, risk factors. All right. And then competency three would be um, being able to describe the behavioral, psychological, physiological, and uh, social effects um, of psychoactive substances on the individual. Uh, and by the way, there are significant others, right? So I'm sure most of you know or have experience with this, but it's not just about the person that's using, you know, the whole family dynamic can change based on, uh, based on an individual substance use um, be because of all of the factors that go in involved, right? Um, protecting the individual, uh, enabling, you know, all kinds of stuff that, that happens. And then competency for recognizing, you know, the potential for substance use disorders to also mimic a variety of medical and mental health um, conditions. Um, and so that's like really, really important too, realizing, uh, realizing that, for instance, someone with acute methamphetamine intoxication, uh, those symptoms may mimic um, symptoms of schizophrenia, right? For instance, they're hearing voices, they're seeing shadow people, um, those kinds of things, right? Now, that doesn't mean that they don't have schizophrenia, but that, that's kind of some of the stuff that has to be parsed out a little bit. Um, and all of that is done through assessment as well. And, and I'll also say this, you know, when it comes to treatment, we want to treat both at the same time. That's, that's why we talk about like co-occurring, right? So someone has um, uh, some mental health concerns, right? Um, and they also have some uh, substance use concerns, both of those happening at the same time. Um, and we treat both at the same time. So I know this was one of the questions that is on the, on the homework, talking about the disease model. And I know you read some things about the disease model. So the original disease model is, is known as the Minnesota model. And um, it, I'm gonna fast forward through these. We're gonna talk about, oops, we're gonna talk about all of these. And the, and the Minnesota model, uh, well, let me see if I'm gonna get, 
oh, no, here's what I'm going to do because we're going to get deeper into it. So there's the Minnesota model, which is really kind of based on abstinence. And it's an older model. Um, and uh, definitely we're going to talk about that. We're also going to talk about the psychoanalytic model, which is comes from Freud, right? And the idea of uh, attachment theory. Um, and then there's the learning uh, theory models, right? So modeling behavior, operant conditioning, classical conditioning, um, and then of course, cognitive behavioral therapy. And then there's the family model, right? It involves family systems. It's kind of like what I was talking about earlier when it called, when it, when, uh, when the identified patient, this is what, how they uh, talk with the, within the family systems model. That's the individual that is using the substances. And then what is happening with the dynamic of the family surrounding that? How, how is the system uh, supporting it, helping it, not helping it, whatever the case may be. And then there's the biopsychosocial model, which some of you may be familiar with as well. So we're gonna go into these a little bit deeper. All right, so first let's look at the disease model. Um, you know, originally uh, alcoholic was coined in, you know, 1849. Um, and for those of you who have ever heard the term falling off the wagon, a uh, little trivia here. Um, let me see if I have that here. Maybe I do, I don't. Okay, so a little trivia, you know, falling off the wagon, you know, in the mid 18th century, um, they, <laughs> they, or the mid 19th century, I should say, um, they would go around and, collect the alcoholics, right? And falling off the wagon meant that literally they dropped off off the wagon, right? We now know that to mean that they've started drinking again or relapsed or there's been a recurrence. Um, but that's where that also comes from is, is, is the mid 19th century. And then of course, uh, 1930s, um, Bill Wilson, Dr. Bob um, came along. Uh, and of course there was Dr. Silkworth's theory about alcoholism and AA was born. The first AA meeting really, if you think about it, was the meeting between Bill W and Dr. Bob um, in uh, 1935, uh, 34. Well, Bill's sobriety dates December 11th, 1934. I forget when he exactly met Bill W. Might've been right in that area. My point is, is, um, they worked with Dr. Silkworth who had worked with a lot of alcoholics. And he was the one that came up with the idea that alcoholism was that it involved both physical and mental um, aspects of it, right? Craving, physical allergies, how it was described, the obsession of the mind, right? Um, and then in the 1960s, the uh, E.M. Jelinek who um, came up with the Jelinek curve, which unfortunately I should have put an example of it here, but the Jelinek curve is, um, talks about how, you know, in the beginning, someone's drinking may be um, experimental and then they're using for fun. And then they, um, then it gets worse and they begin to have consequences, right? And it kind of goes down in this little slope um, and at the bottom is, well, literally they're hitting bottom. Um, and, you know, a person, once they hit bottom in the Jelinek curve, uh, you know, they can, they can be in that situation for a very, very long time. And then the other side of the Jelinek curve goes back up and that's the recovery side, right? A person makes a decision, um, they're, they're changing their drinking habits. They begin to recover, uh, physical manifestations improve, their health improves, things like that. So um, I do not have a Jelinek curve here. Uh, I'll have to, I should have put that in here, but uh, any, okay, let me just stop here. Uh, any questions so far on the disease model that, that we've talked about? So we know it's physical, you know, it's mental, it involves cravings. Um, Um, yeah, so with the disease model, um, is, is there room for like a harm reduction mentality or is it fully like you're either in or you're out kind of thing? No, I, 
and that's a great question, right? Um, there is room for the harm reduction, right? So any in in any way that we can engage a client that helps them reduce their harm. Now it might be abstinence. That that might be the the way to do it. Sometimes people are not ready for abstinence yet, right? Um, I think what's important with the disease model, um, and and um, and I personally subscribe to it, right? Because we know that there are physiological changes that occur within the brain, within the body's tissues um, that support the disease model, right? Um, the way the Minnesota model um, was was originally uh, described is it is totally abstinence based, right? Um, but I would say today, modernizing a little bit, it is perfectly appropriate to approach a client in a harm reduction manner. Now, of course, it also depends on what kind of program you're in. So it's also going to be, it, it is going to be program dependent. For instance, my program, um, like I'm thinking of a client right now who, you know, he's struggling. One would argue using harm reduction, he has made progress and he has but not completely meeting the program requirement of abstinence. So you can see sometimes there's a, there's a little bit of a conflict. Does that make sense? And did I answer yeah. your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so Professor, by, uh, by harm reduction, are you speaking of things like uh, suboxone or methadone or, and then not meeting the program requirements because it requires complete abstinence from those things or are you speaking of something else um so what you're so let me break that down i am kind of speaking of something else because with uh the the two items that you mentioned those are actually medically assisted treatment medications so if they are um diagnosed i mean if they are prescribed uh mats um I could see how you might look at that as harm reduction, but in in my program, they would still be considered abstinent because they are not using heroin. Not using street drugs. Illicit. They're not using fentanyl, right. And they're not doing it illicitly, right? They're under the care of a doctor. Okay. It as, now, if they stop taking it as prescribed, right? So they get the little um, uh, suboxone, right? And they're taking more, than they're supposed to be. Now, now we're moving back into, okay, this is this is a form of use, right? Okay. That may be addressed that we that we would need to address, right? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, but harm reduction would be, for example, uh, somebody who's using heroin and they stop using heroin, uh, but they're drinking, right? So the risk of overdose is being reduced. And we may want to talk about their, their alcohol consumption, depending on how it is, right? Um, and I know sometimes people will struggle with that. Uh, needle exchange program is another example of harm reduction, right? Um, you know, so there, there are different levels of harm reduction and different ways that harm reduction can be approached. And I think I saw Juanita's hand. Wondering what harm reduction is re oh, what harm reduction is really all about. And I'm guessing, and I'm new to all of this. I'm learning a lot, but um, I'm not a I'm not a I'm not a genius. I mean, I'm a genius, but I'm not mastered all of this stuff yet. So my thing is, is harm reduction re the actual. Why is everybody so big on it now? Is it, is it Medi-Cal related? Because uh, I know back in the day, we didn't have anything. We barely had Genie uh, and stuff like that. We we're getting crashed and how some metamorphosis, a few other problems. But yeah, uh, if, you, if you tested dirty one or two times, you were gone. Right, so right. Gone. So yeah. I don't know if that was that because Medi-Cal was saying if they're not clean, they got to go, we're not going to pay you. No. Or, okay, so what? So harm reduction is what is it all about because i'm so curious because i'm wondering who okay. are we okay i think i i think i got your question so you're yeah. asking you're asking about what is harm reduction about first thing i'll say about harm reduction is it's a way to reach 
it's a way to reach certain individuals that may not be reached in any other way. So okay. That's, first of all, that's how I'll say that. Thank you. I'm, what yeah. I see, and I'm so sorry, and I need to, I have to ask this question, and I hate to interrupt you. And you answered most of my question. That I that, that did it for me. But I was curious as to how to apply it as a worker, because when you see a person using it in vain, and then I'm gonna be quiet. Okay. <laughs> so a person using. So when you say using it in vain, when you say a person, are you talking about a clinician? or client, a client a client and or clinicians or and or clinicians because okay, so, um, you know it's just many different ways i've seen it happen yeah so let's mm -hmm. just let's just look at it from the clinician side for a minute first of all i will always say that if the clinician is working harder than the client there's a problem there okay so there, there could be a problem with boundaries there could be a problem with training there could be a problem with uh, improper interventions lack of knowledge yeah. All, all that stuff, okay? Yes. If, if you're looking at the client side and, and a client you, we might say is being manipulative or we might yes. say they're taking advantage of the situation, right? Yes. You might, you might be absolutely true, right? Mm -hmm. um, but remember, clients are coming in, they're not on the top of their game. Okay. <laughs> they need help, right? Yes. So, um, so showing unconditional positive regard. Okay. Uh, Having firm boundaries, that's the best thing that we can do yes, for our Yes, I noticed that works a lot. Yes, okay. Because yeah. I was okay. wondering. Well, wait, 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 wait. Yes. Juanita, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yes. I really can't have a conversation here. Okay, yes. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, sir. I, okay. Thank right. you. Yeah. Harm we can talk offline. Then. Abstinent, complete abstinence is harm reduction. I just wanted to say that too. That's what the strictest form of harm reduction. Yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. But normally, when when we when we think of the term harm reduction, uh, it is because uh, you are absolutely correct. Um, but normally, when we're talking about harm reduction in the sense that I'm talking about it now, it's usually less than abstinence. Does that make sense? Yes. And obviously, abstinence is the goal. That's the goal of every harm reduction program, right? Is to get them to to, well, I shouldn't say every. Anytime you hear someone use every, always, never, that's usually a problem word. Um, but a lot of programs um, are designed to, to move a person toward ab complete abstinence. Absolutely. Um, but sometimes a, a, a person, and again, this is why I'm having you guys do the TTM, right? Um, the uh, knowing uh, what stage of change the individual is in is going to determine what interventions that we're using. So someone who's pre-contemplative on their heroin IV use, sharing needles, they may not be ready to stop using heroin, but we might be able to get them to at least do some needle exchange, right? You see what I'm saying? So they're not ready for complete abstinence, but we might be ready. They might be ready um, you know, for a little bit of healthier decision making. I know it sounds, it's difficult, um, but but there are some legitimacy too. All right, so, um, so the 1970s, right? Uh, integration of, of these models into treatment programs uh, was rebranded into the Minnesota model. It's totally abstinence-based as I, as I had said earlier. And so, Getting back to um, part of Juanita's question, right? So if a person, and I'm gonna reframe the word dirty into positive. So if a person tests positive on a year, on a year analysis, indicating that they've had a recurrence of use, yeah, it, it was uh, zero tolerance and the person got kicked out. Now, personally, ethically, if we think about this, we're kicking a person out of treatment for confirming their diagnosis. And to me, that does not make sense. Um, so now, you know, like where I work, you know, a, a person does not get um, discharged from the program simply because they've used. Actually, I've had some clients that have used a couple of times, right? Now, eventually it may end up that way, but it's usually not the first thing. We're not zero tolerance, for example. Um, which if you think about it, even though we're abstinence-based, 
kind of is a form of harm reduction, less than abstinence if their frequency of use and what they're using has changed, right? It's less dangerous. Um, and this is also where, you know, treatment centers began utilizing, you know, non-professional staff in recovery, um, professional um, and professionally trained staff. That's what you guys are, are learning to do, learning to be professionals. Um, and it involved individual treatment planning, family involvement, uh, which is, which is a, actually a good thing. And the key components around this model also was powerlessness, denial, continued use, uh, despite uh, negative consequences, right? Patterns of use, you'll recognize this as kind of uh, floating all around um, uh, some, the way people think about it and, and also diagnosing substance use disorders, right? When you think of patterns of use, continued use, the compulsion, even though they're having negative consequences. All right, then there's the, then there's learning theories, uh, which is another theory that, well, and I will talk about as we go through it, uh, but learning theories um, have some validity to them as well. And we actually use some of these in treatment, at least I do today in treatment, right? So Albert Bandura, he is, um, you know, he was a kind of like a learning theorist and he uh, came up with modeling uh, behavior, right? I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the Bobo doll experiments. I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, I thought it was right there, but it's not. Um, but he conducted experiments using a Bobo doll where um, individuals or kids that were exposed to uh, violent television programming um, or exposed to uh, watching adults um, behave violently toward a doll or toward something and then not. So you had two, two different groups of kids. And those that observed the adult um, behaving, you know, in a, in a more violent or aggressive way uh, and not being, um, by the way, punished for it, um, Later on, they were put in a room with a Bobo doll and the kids were observed, you know, beating on the Bobo doll, et cetera. Uh, so it was, it's the Bobo doll experiment. And um, if I had more time, I would show you videos of it. But what he said was, is we learn through modeling. We learn through observing others. Um, and so this was also part of what was used to explain the initiation of AOD use, alcohol and other drug use. Um, especially in adolescence, right? So we observe our friends do it, maybe we observe our parents do it, whatever the case may be. So model, learning through modeling. And then there is also um, operant conditioning and conditioning. And that's uh, where AOD use is influenced by either positive reinforcement. So positive meaning something's being added, not that it's a good thing, but think of addition and subtraction when you think of positive and negative, right? So positive reinforcement, something is being added in the case of using drugs, it's the euphoria, it's the rush, right? Um, and then negative reinforcement, something is being taken away. So they're using it to, for anxiety relief, tension relief, um, or to avoid withdrawal symptoms, right? So that's um, operant conditioning at work there. And then reinforcement that occurs closer in time to the actual be behavior will have a greater influence on future behavior um, than the reinforcing factors that occur later. So in other words, um, I'm using something and that positive reinforcement comes right away. That's gonna have a very uh, great influence on whether or not I'm gonna repeat that behavior again in the future. And then there's also expectancies. What am I going to expect out of uh, what I am doing, right? So that is also part of operant conditioning. I'll also say this, in, in, the, in what I do, I actually, we use operant conditioning at drug court, but not for this, but we use positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement uh, in order um, to shape behavior as well. Uh, for instance, that's where 
sanctions and kudos comes in, rewards and, and kind of punishments come in. So it can be used on the other side. And then the other thing is um, uh, teaching the clients about self-efficacy, right? Um, helping them learn that they can actually uh, remain abstinent, right? Um, that they have it within them to, to do that. Oh, here's the pictures of the Bobo doll experiments that I was talking about, right? And so these are kids being observed after they were exposed to the adult modeling this very similar behavior. By the way, the, the control group of kids um, that were not presented with the violent behavior did not respond this way in, in general with, with the Bobo doll. So it's just no, some more um, evidence that modeling is, is an important part of learning. So at the top picture you see, that's the adult that is mistreating the Bobo doll. And then you see the kids afterwards doing the same thing. What rings your bell? Every time we talk about classical conditioning, that's my favorite question to ask. So for those that are not familiar with classical conditioning, um, that is, um, was discovered by Dr. Pavlov. He was a Russian scientist who was studying digestion in, in dogs. And he discovered um, uh, that the dogs would salivate without any food being present at the ring of a bell. He actually trained them to salivate. Now, salivation is one of those things that normally would not happen at the ring of a bell. But if you present food and ring a bell, present food and ring a bell, present food and ring a bell, pretty soon the dog is gonna associate the bell with food. And salivation will become what's known as a conditioned response, right? So the bell becomes an external cue um, for, the, for the dog to salivate because he believes he's gonna get fed. Now let's turn this into humans. So external cues for humans is seeing drug paraphernalia, seeing a little baggie, seeing someone that you've used with can be a trigger, right? Um, to have cravings for the drugs. Internal cues would be negative mood states, right? So I'm in a bad mood, or I'm feeling anxious. That can create a uh, craving. Um, it can actually, um, if it's strong enough, uh, actually create physical manifestations, somatic symptoms that, um, that make us crave the drugs. And then there's cognitive behavioral therapy, the rational emotive, REBT, uh, and cognitive theories um, that, uh, that we use to try to help reprogram thoughts in order to um, reduce craving, uh, reduce um, uh, wanting uh, to use, right? And so we teach coping skills like anger management, re relaxation techniques, um, assertiveness training, right? Um, and, you know, the whole idea is uh, to make it so that, you know, drug use is not a reasonable option, right? You know, kind of take that away. All right, so, so that's learning. Let's see, I got some uh, chat. So let me see if there's any questions in the chats. Hold on one second. Um, okay, so some of this. Uh, I knew you were going <laughs> to mention ringing the bell. Yeah, so somebody's been in my psychology class. But that's the other cool thing about teaching psychology because I actually get a lot of AODS students in my psychology classes, which I love. Yeah, in, in my psychology class, I go much deeper into Pavlov. Here, we're just kind of like skimming over it a little bit. Um, so any questions on any of the learning theories? Um, that we talked about or need any clarification on? Yes, Professor, could you just explain the Jelinek curve again for me? Um, so let me, while it's bad, this is why I should have put up a, uh, 
hold on, let me see something real quick. Let me see if I can do something real quick. While I'm doing that, any other questions? I'm gonna stop recording because I'm gonna stop sharing and reason recording. All right, any other questions? All right, so now we're gonna move into psychoanalytic theory. And this is, this is Sigmund Freud, um, another individual that I get into a little bit more detail in uh, psychology. We talk about throughout the semester. Um, so today we'll just be kind of skimming the, the, the surface. Um, but he came up with the idea of the self-medication hypothesis, which is interesting because we talk about self-medication all the time, right? That people are using substances um, to self-medicate. So a person that is having anxiety, you know, uh, may drink because they, they believe that it kind of helps relieve that anxiety, right? Um, or they may use uh, Xanax illicitly. They're not going to a doctor, um, but they're getting Xanax illicitly and using it. Um, ironically, maybe they're using marijuana at the same time, which by the way, would increase a person's anxiety. Um, but this is where their expectancies come in. If they don't believe that, they're not going to realize that some of what they're doing is making their anxiety worse, causing them to self-medicate more, right? Um, you know, the other part of this idea is that individuals self-select drugs based on their personality organization or their ego impairments. Well, that's another theory um, or another hypothesis, I should say. Um, and then of course, depressants minimize the feelings of isolation, emptiness, uh, being related to anxiety and depression, uh, tension. Um, stimulants enhance their sense of self-worth uh, and grandiosity. Maybe they're a little shy, maybe they're a wallflower, and all of a sudden they're out in the middle of the dance floor, right? Um, and, and so that's part of uh, the self-medication hypothesis as well, right? Based on maybe their their individual personality um, things. And I see a raised hand, go ahead. So professor, is that saying that um, that would be only through um, um, medications that are prescribed would, would put you in this, in this uh, model? No. No. no, no, this model is basically saying that people select their drugs based on these things. So, but what's right. important to, you know, we talk about self-medication all the time. And whereas, you know, I think that sometimes that kind of makes sense. It, this particular, what we're talking about here, um, not really validated through research. There's not a whole lot of research that actually says that, yes, this is what people are doing, right? Um, however, this is where I'm saying, this can be viewed as a clinically useful topic right, to, to uh, draw clients out about why they are seeking, why they engage in the drug-seeking behavior that they do, right? So um, I think it's a useful tool for that conversation with clients, but also um, I will give you an example. At a case conference session, I would never say, oh, this client is self-medicating. Because really, there, there, there's not a lot of research that supports that. Does that make sense? Um, you know, so it's hard to clinically rationalize that. But I might use it. Say, hey, why are you using this? What, what, what is? What are your expectancies from methamphetamine? What are your expectancies from uh, from heroin use? Right, things like that. So you'll hear self medication all the time. I'm not saying we don't use it. We don't talk to clients about it. It's, it's important to know though, it's not really validated through research. And when getting back to evidence-based practice, um, that's one of the things that we, that we are, um, uh, that we wanna stick to is, is actually researched items. Um, so another, hypothesis uh, around this would be around, um, you know, an individual experiencing an attachment disorder, right? So they have unmet 
developmental needs, unfulfilling relationships. Um, they have underdeveloped interpersonal skills, right? And so when this happens with an individual, according to this hypothesis, is that you know, the individual is left with, um, with an impaired sense of self, right? They feel incomplete or they don't feel good enough, right? Um, and so as a result of that, they may engage in, in substance using uh, behavior. Uh, they may experience the inability to um, regulate emotions, right? Um, or so often, and you may experience this working with clients, they're not even able to describe emotions, right? Or identify where they are. Um, so they rely on, you know, external sources, uh, for example, AODs for support or, you know, to help them through. Um, this is consistent with the disease model of addiction. Um, and then certain uh, individuals do cross over into states of addiction um, and can never safely use mind altering substances without getting into the cycle of chronic use. Um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the individual who uses methamphetamine and they use it for a while, they use it for a while, they don't experience any psychosis, they don't experience auditory or visual hallucinations, right? And they're using, and then, then after a period of chronic use, they begin to experience those things. Um, and then once they start experiencing it, what I've observed, and this is anecdotal, I didn't research it, um, but it kind of goes along with this, they can never go back to using without experiencing those psychotic symptoms. So something happens, they cross over and, and they cross a line and every time they use meth, they go off the deep end. Whereas earlier they didn't. Um, and it's, it's the same thing with addiction. And if you've ever heard the term cross addiction, um, uh, you know, using one substance and using any other substance that's kind of similar to it, they're, at, they're at, going to be addicted to that as well, right? They're going to experience a severity of substance use disorder with that as well. Um, this does also endorse the support of 12-step groups. Um, so I will say this about 12-step groups. Um, oh, I forget which research study that involved it. Um, study on the success rates and stuff, which is kind of hard to do with 12-step groups, but they have found to be very efficacious for individuals um, in developing self-efficacy and, and supporting their recovery use, which is why a lot of programs um, send people out to 12-step groups. Um, but there are other groups too, besides 12-step, such as uh, Life Ring and uh, Smart Recovery. You know, there are other community support groups as well. Um, and then acceptance of who his or her real self is, um, is important, right? So the individual needs to, um, you know, work through shame, um, guilt, um, other negative belief systems that they may have previously denied, right? So helping a person to work through that is also important uh, part of this. All right, any questions on that before we move into family models? All right, so the family systems model focuses on, on the idea that homeostasis, who in here, if you've been in my psychology class, you've heard the term homeostasis, who knows what that means? You can say what, balance. What is it's balance, right? So if we're talking about physiological homeostasis, that's what maintains my heart rate, my body temperature, my rate of breathing, right? It, it, the body's um, maintaining its internal systems, right? And it's physiologically, we're always seeking homeostasis. Well, you know what? The same thing happens in, in families. Um, there's always some balance that is being trying to be maintained um, in a family system. And so homeostasis is really key to this. And that's the family's attempt, right? To engage in their dynamic in such a way 
that it maintains stability within the family. Um, so any action or behavior of one individual affects the entire system. So that's really important to know here. And then substance use it may um, serve as an adaptive function within the family. So the family itself may be dysfunctional and an individual may be engaging in um, substance use because of that, or it could be the other way around. Uh, an individual engaging in substance use kind of disrupts the balance of the family and the family then seeks to, to uh, maintain that balance in any way that it can and actually creates changes not only in the, in the uh, individual using the substances, obviously that's being changed, but also in how people react and respond to that. Um, so for example, teenage drinking in response to marital discord, right? So there's some family um, dysfunction happening there. And what ends up happening is, is that drinking distracts the parents from the discord, unifies the parents in an effort to deal with the child's emerging crisis, right? But the discord's still there, by the way. <laughs> it's just not being dealt with. Um, and now the, 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 the child's drinking, which may increase, right? Um, you can see how this, this will be very quickly out of balance. So that's, that's that way. Um, so family rules in family systems, you know, uh, I don't know if anyone here has, you know, ever grown up in, or if they're an adult child of an alcoholic, some of this stuff may be familiar, or maybe some of your clients have talked about this, right? Um, but family rules become inflexible, they become rigid. Um, so we don't talk about dad's drinking. You know, we don't confront mom about her drinking because she's fragile, may push her over the edge. She may drink more, right? Um, so these are some of the things that, that uh, may come up in this situation. The other thing that really happens is boundary disruptions. This is oftentimes why when our clients come in, they don't have a lot of boundaries because they it was never modeled for them. So in group, that's where you see people rescuing each other, right? <laughs> right, so that's a kind of a boundary violation. Rather than letting the individual kind of work through their stuff, someone comes in to, to, to rescue. That's another you know, example. So in the example here, in an attempt to rescue her son, mom becomes overprotective, makes excuses uh, for him, the son. Father becomes overly punitive or disengaged. Um, mother becomes aligned with the son. Father feels like an outsider. So you can see how the disruption in the family dynamic occurs and it just gets worse. And then roles change. So the chemically dependent person, you have the chief enabler, you have the hero, you have the scapegoat, you have the lost child. I'm sure you've heard um, some of these terms um, over the years. All right, any questions on the family mom? And then there's the biopsychosocial model which um, if for those working in the field, you're probably very familiar with this. I use this all the time as well. And it's the idea that, that the individuals that we're working with, that, that there's a confluence of, of uh, forces at work, right? So you have the psychological, you have the biological, and you have the uh, sociological um, aspects of it. So with psychological, right? We're right back to learning, uh, behavior, perceptions, beliefs, uh, all, all of these kinds of um, things that are in, in our mind, right? And then biological, first of all, we know that there's a genetic predisposition to alcoholism and uh, substance use disorders. So uh, neurochemistry, um, medication effects, you know, uh, overstimulated fight or flight response, the sympathetic nervous system, overall arousal, uh, those kinds of things can impact. And then of course, social, um, social. what's their family background? How are their 
interpersonal relationships? Um, what's their socioeconomic status? All of these things um, play into, uh, into this according to the biopsychosocial framework. Um, the other thing with the biopsychosocial model is that, that it talks about there's multiple um, pathways to addiction, right? So first there's the biochemical factors. Uh, so for instance, uh, I already kind of talked about genetic transmission a little bit, epigenetics, in other words, gene activation um, requiring environmental interaction. So let me explain that for just a second. So a person may have, for instance, a genetic predisposition for alcoholism. That doesn't necessarily mean that that gene will become activated. There is also the idea of this nature versus nurture. So I might have the predisposition for it, but I am I'm raised in a very um, healthy environment and uh, that, that range of reaction in, in the genetic factors is, is more positively influenced um, uh, than negatively influenced. So I may not develop full expression of that gene. Does that make sense? I wanna make sure, because this can be kind of confusing sometimes uh, for individuals. So I can have the pre genetic predisposition, but envir environmental factors don't display it in such a way where I actually go on to develop that behavior. And we've learned this from like twin studies as, a, as an example, twins that are separated at birth and things like that. Um, so the other thing I do wanna point out when it comes to this is that a majority of the medical community, if we're looking at all of these, if we're looking at the dopamine system, the pleasure reward system, if we're looking at genetics, um, if we're looking at uh, neuro uh, transmission in the brain, um, majority of the medical community views addiction as a brain disease. And, and it really is. We put stuff into our body, first of all, uh, and it changes us. Um, but there are other influences for it as well. So, um, sorry, just lost my train of thought. Something else I was going to say, and I forgot what it was. Why come on? Let me, uh, let me see. If I get triggered. Um, no, that's not helping. So <laughs> let's move on to the next section of this. So in, also in the biopsychosocial model. So the first part is, would be more of, a, uh, of the physiological, right? The bio. Uh, and then in the social model, right? We're looking at expectancies. So um, if I have a certain expectancy that this is gonna be really good, I'm more likely to use a particular substance. My, the, the peer group of my, attitude, right? Um, if I'm, uh, I remember when I was, you know, in high school, no, by the way, my dad was a juvenile detective. So, you know, uh, <laughs> my peer group was, uh, was uh, very closely monitored by my father. Um, but if I was hanging out with the oh, quote unquote, and don't take this the wrong way, I'm just using it as a, as a slang term that, that we used when I was a kid. I was hanging out with the stoners, obviously the attitude of that particular peer group would be, yeah, it's okay to smoke pot. And, and I might take on that, that belief system as well. Maybe I engage in that. Then there's also media influences, right? Um, what you see on Facebook, what you see in commercials, uh, uh, things like that may influence um, an individual's expectancy on what they would get out of using. And then there's also cue reactivity. Um, this is conditioned response. Think cue activity, think ring my bell. What's ringing my bell? So this is um, what happens even after a prolonged period of, of abstinence, a person can still experience triggering events. And then there's also self-efficacy. And by the way, cue reactivity, that's why we teach refusal skills. And that's why we teach other coping skills to help the individual uh, work through that trigger. 
And then there's self-efficacy, which is basically self-efficacy is my personal belief on how I'm able to cope. Can I handle certain situations? And this is another uh, thing, another reason why some of the things that we do in treatment is really designed to build a client's self-efficacy. And then that would include social skills training, refusal skills, assertiveness training, anger management, you know, all the stuff that we do in these groups um, is, is, is geared toward this. All right, so in conclusion, well, first, any questions before the conclusion part of, of the biopsychosocial model? All right. Um, so addiction begins and continues because of biochemical factors, disorders of the self, right? So this might be an individual's uh, co-occurring symptoms that they may be experiencing, uh, learned or conditioned factors like what's ringing my bell? Why am I go into that automatic behavior? Uh, family and social factors that we've talked about. And then um, the other thing is neuroadaptation and neurotransmitter dysregulation. Um, is also predominant factor in the develop, uh, development of addictive disorders. And so remember, as a person is taking in stuff, if they already have a neurochemical imbalance, substance use is gonna make it worse, by the way. So. All right, any questions? All right, so let's do this. Let's go ahead and take um, uh, a 16 minute break because it's, Looks like it's 7, 714. So we'll come back at 730. Uh, and while you guys are on break, I'm going to try to do two things. One, take roll. So make sure you don't log out and um, so that I can see who's here. And also, I'm going to help Alvin out. So Alvin, you kind of got to give up your break for a little bit, but I need something to drink. So I'll be right back. Alvin, everyone else, enjoy. Calvin, I'm just heading to my refrigerator. <laughs> Grab my tea. Okay. Thank you for your patience with me. No problem. All right. So let's, uh, let me, oh, shoot. I'm still so, recording too. <laughs> so part of that is a little missing. Apologize for that. Um, and then understanding the value of an interdisciplinary approach. So, uh, so tonight we, uh, during a couple of presentations from the resources, they kind of talked a little bit about interdisciplinary approaches, right? Having uh, psychiatry on staff, having therapists on staff, having AOD counselors on staff, having um, employment specialists on staff, uh, using these different at nursing um, uh, nurses on staff, right? And so using a interdisciplinary approach in, in treatment uh, is important. All right. So um, we're actually going to look at a couple of videos. Um, and well, let's watch the first video. And then let's, uh, and I'm actually, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording to play the video because when I post this, I don't want any um, uh, copyright issues on YouTube. So I'm gonna pause the recording, we'll watch the video and then we'll have a discussion on it. The videos are gonna be posted for you guys to, to view also in Canvas if you wanna look at this again. 